and I would like to introduce our wonderful speaker for this evening. In addition to being a Virginia Beach Master Gardener since 2011, Stacy McGraw is the Green Infrastructure Programs Director for Wetlands Watch and the Virginia Co-Coordinator of the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Program. Stacy's focus areas include living shorelines, native plants, and invasive plant species. She is a level one certified urban stormwater professional, a Southeast Virginia regional co-coordinator for the Plant Virginia Natives Initiatives, and member of the statewide Blue Ridge Prism Invasive Plant Species Steering Committee. And with that, I turn this over to Stacy. Thank you so much. All right, good evening, everybody. Get my screen shared here. All right, is everybody seeing that okay? Yes. Great. All right, then we will jump right in and get started um, with plant this, not that. So some of the guiding principles um, for this talk, uh, this is a brand new talk for me. Um, so if you have feedback, um, I'd love to have your comments um, in the chat as we go. You can also add um, questions there and we will um, take those at the end. <laughs> so first I'm going to encourage you all to choose non-invasive plants. Um, We'll go over the reasons why, um, if that's not a familiar topic for you, um, but it's generally discouraged. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some native plants and the weedy moniker that they sometimes get. Um, and just have an understanding that all plants reproduce in one way or another. So growth and spread are just part of having gardens. Um, and likewise, all gardens require some maintenance. So this isn't, um, a, you know, a put it out there and forget about it kind of endeavor. Um, when it comes to natives versus non-natives, there is room for compromise. Um, it doesn't have to be all one way or the other. And ultimately it's your garden and your goals that are going to um, lead the way in making a lot of the decisions about what you put out there to enjoy. So when we talk about um, invasive plants, um, this is not a term that is really applied to plants that are natively occurring in an area. Invasive can only be non-native species. Native plants can be aggressive, they can be um, you know, easy to spread around, but they're not invasive, um, largely because they aren't going to cause the ecological harm that we typically associate with the non-native invasive plants. Um, invasive plants, um, when they are introduced um, into a natural area can change a lot of the characteristics of that area. They can change how likely it is to catch fire. Um, they can actually change the soil chemistry uh, to make it more hospitable for them and less hospitable for the species that should be naturally occurring there. Um, and they have the ability to invade undisturbed natural communities. Um, when we go out into our gardens and we disturb the soil, we often stir up weed seed. And as we bring those to the surface, they're able to get some light, they germinate, um, when you disturb ground, it is expected that you will have some unwanted plants, at least in the short term. Um, invasives are able to go into these undisturbed natural areas um, where that kind of activity hasn't happened um, and still get a foothold and cause that kind of damage. So how do you know if you are out shopping um, you see a plant that you like, how do you know if it's invasive? 
um, I don't think anybody sets out to, you know, hit up the garden center and I'm going to buy 10 invasive plants and see how much ecological harm I can do. I don't think anybody says that. Um, I think most of the plants that end up in our yards that maybe aren't the best choices are because people just don't know. Um, the Department of Conservation and Recreation for Virginia um, keeps this list. These are just, this is not the full list. Um, these are just little snippets of it. Um, but it gives you some really good information, um, starting with the scientific name um, of the plant so that you are certain that you are talking about the same plant that they are talking about when you read a plant label. Um, also includes a common name um, and how invasive it's considered. So this list is divided into four categories, um, highly invasive, medium, low, and then species of concern. So um, ones that may be labeled in one of those other categories later, but for now it's just being watched and assessed. And then it breaks it down by the region of Virginia. So if you all are joining from the coastal region, um, then you're looking in that far right column to see if this is a problem species where you live. Um, and if you're in other parts, um, then those other columns may apply to you. So that's a good place to start. Um, the second place um, when I'm interested to know, um, you know, how a plant's going to behave or what we know about it, um, especially if it's not on this list, because um, this is not an exhaustive list of problem species in Virginia. Um, I do an internet search and I look for reputable sources. So um, usually universities or extension programs from states just to the south of us. So I'm really looking at North Carolina and South Carolina because if something is invasive there, as um, we continue to see temperatures increase and the USDA's heat zones, um, or hardiness zones rather, change over time, then species that are problems there may easily become problems here. Um, and uh, when you are looking at plant tags um, and you're shopping, sometimes it doesn't have this full scientific name on it. Um, it will just have the genus and then a cultivar name. Um, and so it's not always easy to tell that it's the same species as what you would find on this list. Um, but a quick Google search um, usually will reveal um, that full name and you can check it against the list. Here are some of, um, and this is by no means a complete representation, um, but these are some of the invasive plants that are common in Virginia. And these are ones that I repeatedly see in home landscapes. Um, if they're in yours, you do not have to confess that. You probably didn't plant it. Um, when I moved into my house, um, we had several of these. We still have a couple because they're problematic to get rid of, um, but I didn't plant them either. So um, the Lenocera japonica is that bright yellow and white um, Japanese honeysuckle that spreads um, kind of over shrubbery and trees and forms thickets. Um, Miscanthus sinensis um, comes in a lot of different cultivar names, um, but it's usually just referred to as silver grass. Um, the cultivars were thought to be um, sterile so that they wouldn't spread the way the species does through seed. That's true to varying degrees. Ligustrum sinensis is still widely sold in almost every garden center. Um, and if you take a drive in the next uh, several weeks to a month um, through Virginia, you'll see this um, blooming along many of the highways and roads in the state, uh, particularly up the Eastern shore, it's problematic. Um, English ivy, I'm sure everybody is familiar with. 
And my personally personal least favorite invasive plant is the uh, wisteria sinensis, um, the Chinese wisteria. This is the plague of my yard from a planting that a neighbor made about 35 years ago. Um, so these things do stick around and last for a while. But on the other hand, we tend to call natives weeds. Um, there are lots of um, really good native plants that weed is just part of their name. I don't know if that discourages people from buying and planting them or not, um, but it doesn't seem like the best marketing uh, strategy. And I'm, I know that I'm not the first to say that. Um, but I did look up um, what the definition of a weed is. Um, and if you do that, you'll find almost as many definitions as you will find weeds in a garden. Um, but this is the one that I really liked um, and thought was most relevant for this talk. Um, a weed is a plant considered undesirable in a particular situation, growing where it conflicts with human preferences, needs, or goals. And to me, that definition means that any plant can be a weed. Um, if it's growing where you don't want it, you don't like it, um, or it's not performing the way you wanted it to, then it can go from a desirable plant to a weed pretty quickly. Um, another way to say that is any plant out of place. And that is a definition that I've heard many master gardeners say over the years. So if you want to try out natives, choose ones that match your garden style. Um, there are so many out there that are available. They're becoming more frequently available in the retail stores. We have some specialty native plant nurseries locally. Uh, you can buy things on the internet, get them from Master Gardener Plant Sales um, in many of the cities and from organizations like the Native Plant Society. Um, some of our museums, the Botanic Garden, um, are also offering native plants for sale, you know, seasonally. So then make sure <clears throat> that you're putting this plant in the right place. And the right place for you may not be the optimal place for the plant. If you really love a plant that tends to spread very easily and cause um, a high level of maintenance, you may want to put it somewhere where it's a little less happy as a means of controlling that spread. Um, you can also put them in containers to keep those more aggressive ones um, in check, or you can choose areas of your yard that um, you're okay with them naturalizing and having a little bit more of that wild look. Um, and allow the plants to do what they do best. So it all depends on what you want your garden to be. Um, and these are a few of the plants that um, they are important natives. They have great ecological benefits associated with them. I would not necessarily rec uh, recommend that you plant them directly into your garden. Um, they are extremely aggressive. They spread by multiple means. And the seeds or the underground root or rhizome structures that allow them to spread persist for a long time. So you may go and pull uh, cut leaf cone flower or the Rebecca, Rebecca luciniata um, until you're blue in the face and you think you've gotten it all. You didn't let any plants get tall enough to produce seed and um, you know resupply the seed bed. And yet the next season you'll come back and there are more growing um, because something disturbed the soil 
Um, it could have been gardening activities, it could have been animals, it could have been birds um, grubbing around in the soil. And the seeds were brought up close enough to the surface that they were able to germinate. And now you have more cut leaf cone flower. That is um, a story from personal experience. Um, the other three I do have in my yard, um, but I am careful about where they are planted. And I understand that choosing those plants means that I am also choosing a certain level of maintenance to keep them under control. Um, and I do this in a few different ways. Um, the horsetail that you see at the bottom, the Echocetum hyamal, that is a container only plant for me. Um, for me to be brave enough to, like I could never be brave enough to plant it um, in a setting that you see in this photo um, because it will be all over that hillside in the background unless there's some kind of a hard barrier to keep it from getting over there. Um, but in a container, it does fine. It has a lot of presence. Um, it's got this very upright form um, that looks great um, as that you know tall specimen in a container. Um, the Parthenocissus, it, that's our lovely Virginia creeper. Um, it really is lovely. It turns a brilliant shade of red in the fall. Um, it has a lot of eco benefits associated with it. Birds use it for cover, they eat berries. Um, I think that there are some butterflies or moths that use it as a host plant. Um, I'm not a butterfly expert. But, um, you know, there's a small patch of my fence that I let it grow on and I cut it um, pretty mercilessly to keep it um, just in that one place. Um, the truth is that seed from Virginia creeper is coming at me from every direction um, because we invite birds into the yard and they're planting them everywhere. So I have a patch that I let grow um, and all the rest I'm removing on a pretty regular basis. So it really is okay to compromise um, when you're selecting plants for your garden. And in no way am I saying that you should go and rip out everything that you have um, and start replacing it. That's very expensive. That's very time consuming, labor consuming. Um, what I would recommend is that as you decide that you, you know, a plant is old, it's not doing well anymore, it's not really in the right place, it's outgrown itself, um, or it dies for some reason, um, think about replacing it with something that maybe has some more benefits to it. Um, and according to Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, who's done a lot of research on this, um, we only need about 70% of the plants in our yard to be those native keystone species. Um, and that's to support breeding bird populations. So that's kind of the goal to um, try to achieve. Uh, but that leaves 30% um, of the plants to be whatever you want. And it's important to note that that figure, the 70 versus the 30%, is not the number of plants that you have. It's the biomass. So if you have a very large mature tree, native tree, um, particularly an oak, because it is, um, oak trees support more caterpillar and insect species than any others. Um, but you can plant a lot of herbaceous material that is non-native, um, preferably also not invasive. Um, and still have that 30, 70% division. Um, and if you are gonna do a mix, um, the keystone species that you should be um, prioritizing, I've listed the top five for trees um, and then the top five for perennials. And the National Wildlife Foundation has a fantastic tool. It used to be housed on Doug Tallamy's website um, if any of you are familiar with that from a few years back, um, they'll, now they just have a link to it. Um, but I've put the full address here. And when this gets posted, um, there'll be a PDF 
of some resources uh, for you to look at as well. So, you know, you're going to your garden center, you're picking out plants, you're looking at seed catalogs or internet catalogs, um, however it is that you buy plants, um, and you're trying to make up your mind about what you want. Um, so what is your goal? What is it that you want your garden to do for you? Um, do you want it to be a place where you are just going out there to relax and you have minimal um, maintenance that you have to do? Or do you want to spend hours in the garden because that's your passion? Um, these are kind of some of the questions that you would want to ask yourself. Um, but also, like, what do you want your garden to look like? Not just how are you going to spend time in it, but what look are you after? And the two photos that I've chosen are very similar in design. You, both of them are, you know, a mixed border. You've got some hard edging um, up against some lawn with a fence or a wall behind them. Um, but based on the plant selections, these gardens look very different. The one on top is a little bit more formal. It's definitely um, has more defined shapes to it. While the bottom one, the plants are more in their natural forms. There's not a lot of pruning or hedging that's going to go on in that garden. Um, and these make a real big difference when you're talking about how much maintenance you're willing to do. The one on the top may look like it would be easier to maintain, but in fact, keeping all of those shrubs in those shapes and at those sizes um, is actually a lot more maintenance than um, planting densely with perennials that are going to cover the ground, exclude weeds, um, and that don't require all of that regular touch up to keep them looking nice. Um, you're also gonna look at your growing conditions, sun, shade, wet, dry, um, if, you know, how close are you to the house for the mature sizes of trees and shrubs and how close are you to other plants? Um, another piece of the maintenance is um, if you plant things too closely together, you will have to start dividing and sizing them down um, sooner than you would otherwise. And then are there any other restrictions um, for your property that you need to think about? Um, some HOAs do have rules um, and we have some ways to make even wild-ish landscapes um, fit those rules. Um, but there are other things that we can do less about and give us less flexibility, like utility lines um, or their rights of ways, the city rights of ways. Um, or if you're facing a challenge, like um, you live at the ocean front and you have salt or salt water or brackish water up on some of the rivers uh, that you have to choose plants for. Um, I am not going to talk specifically about salt tolerant plants tonight, but in November, uh, we have another talk that will focus on that. So now we're gonna get into the plants. Um, and I think I've got about a dozen plants um, that we're gonna talk about that are really good choices. Um, and they're easy to grow, they're reliable, um, as far as survival rates, they're not really picky. Um, in the box, the green box, I've listed, you know, some of the considerations for this, what it's appropriate for, um, and then the vital statistics for the plants in that orangey box. Um, I'm going to talk more about um, the con the soil conditions, the moisture conditions, and the what the maintenance. For these look like. So if you choose these, you really know what you're getting into. Um, and we'll start with one of my favorite native plants. Um, it is a keystone species. Um, this is Solidago rugosa, uh, rough goldenrod, wrinkle leaf goldenrod, common goldenrod. It has a lot of common names. Um, there are some really good cultivars out there. 
that um, are a little bit shorter and make this more um, home garden friendly. You can see in this photo, um, it's actually a little bit shorter than most of those garden flocks. Um, so you're looking at a height of about two and a half to three feet there. Um, so nothing too crazy, nothing too unmanageable. Um, it does propagate by um, rhizomes and by seed. So I've classified this as like a medium spreader. Um, it's not going to take over in a season or two, but after season three, um, you are going to have to do a little bit of maintenance every year to keep it in the space that you intended it for. Um, this usually means just digging out, um, you know, around the edges of it, um, frequently referred to as shovel pruning, um, around the edges to take those plants out that are not wanted. You can share them with a friend, or you can throw them away. Um, they're extra plants, and if they're not where you want them, they've now become a weed. Um, these are very clumping, and they form these dense um, stands of this plant. They're going to start blooming sometime in the mid to late summer, um, depending on our temperatures, and then they're going to go and how much rain we get. Um, and then they're going to uh, persist into fall, so they're a nice um, two-season color plant there. Um, and as far as being appropriate for containers, that would really uh, only be either a very large container, um, if you're looking at the species, um, or you would want to use one of those um, shorter cultivars. The next one we're going to talk about is Joe Pye. Um, there are several species um, of Joe Pye that are readily available. Um, they're all good. They have slightly different characteristics um, as far as their height. So Dubium tends to be um, a little bit shorter. There's a cultivar called Little Joe that's um, only about two and a half or three feet. The species um, maybe up to about six feet and then Fistulosum um, can actually get up to eight feet. They're pretty wide plants. Um, the two to four feet is not referring to a stand of multiple plants. This is a single plant um, crown that will put up several stems. Um, and they have like a vase type shape. shape. Um, so they're a little bit narrow at the bottom. Um, and then the width is really um, up at the top of the plant. Um, they are very clumping, um, and these are going to bloom in that same general time period as the goldenrod. They start a little bit earlier, so they usually end a little bit earlier. Um, the really dark red stems with the um, almost like a golden green. Uh, kind of a yellowy green uh, colored leaves provide a really good contrast in the garden. Um, and these are great for the back of the border. You probably don't want to put them, um, you know, anywhere mid or front of the border because you're not going to, unless you have something really tall to put behind them. Um, and these are pretty low maintenance plants. They don't require any kind of staking. Um, you are going to have to control the spread by rhizomes, um, but they're slower to do that than the goldenrod. Um, and um, if you're dealing with DBM, it's really just cutting them back the one time each year. Um, the Eutrochium fistulosum is the hollow stemmed Joe Pye weed, and it's better to leave those, cut them back a little bit, um, and then leave those standing through the winter so that the crowns don't collect water and freeze. This is another of my favorites. 
Um, there's nothing tidy or small about this plant. I am not aware of any dwarf cultivars um, or any attempts to make this plant fit in a small space. Um, to me, it's kind of the epitome of my wild garden. Um, it um, does not spread through rhizomes. It will spread by seed, which is why I've only put it um, as a medium spread rate. But this plant um, will reseed freely unless you have some kind of a mulch in place. And if you have mulch in place, the seed doesn't make good contact with the ground and um, you're not gonna get a lot of spread from this, um, but you have to maintain that mulch layer. And it's whatever kind of mulch you would normally use. If it's wood chip mulch, if it's shredded leaves, if it's pine needles, um, as long as you've got a good layer that's keeping these seeds from contacting the ground, you won't have a problem. They don't disperse far, so it's not something where you're going to have them, you know, sprouting up in all different sections of your garden. Um, it would stay pretty close to where that parent plant is. Um, they are very tall. Um, the all of the literature says that they top out at five feet. I am five feet tall, and I rarely see one of these in my yard that is only as tall as me. I would say that that number should really be more like six feet. Um, and they have this great candelabra type shape. So you'll have one stem um, with this, um, you know, bunch of flowers um, and they bloom from the top down. So you have um, you'll start with flowers at the top um, and you get this really long bloom period as those buds open up um, down the length of that flower. So they're very pretty. Um, the stems themselves are um, what you would refer to as a see-through plant. They don't, you don't notice them so much. So if you're going to use this one, it's good to kind of interplant with something that's going to hide those stems um, and provide some color in that lower part of the garden um, or plant something in front of it that will do that. Uh, as far as maintenance, um, you do have to keep that mulch layer um, intact. Other than that, it's cut it down once a year. Um, you can leave this standing through the winter. Um, or if you cut it, you can leave the seed heads somewhere um, and the birds will eat them. Now, there are um, a lot of honeysuckles available for sale out in the retail stores. Mm -hmm. um, almost all of them are also on the invasive species list. Um, this one is the native honeysuckle that does not tend to be invasive. This is not the same as um, what's referred to as the trumpet vine. Um, this is a really great plant. Um, the one pictured is a cultivar called Major Wheeler. There are about a dozen-ish um, cultivars of the Lonicera sempervirens. Um, I tried really hard to get a good picture that would show this containerized. Um, I grow it in my yard on an obelisk and it's been there for almost 10 years. It's never strayed from that spot. I've never found one, um, even right, right next to it where it's like run by rhizomes or anything like that. Um, it's a great plant to attract hummingbirds and hummingbird moths. Um, the bees love it. Lots of butterflies nectar from this. Um, it's really stunning uh, when it's full of blooms and it's semi evergreen. So you can really get some year round interest out of this plant. Um, if we have a warm winter, I sometimes see it flowering um, in December and January. It's not quite as common, um, but it does happen occasionally. And I looked at mine yesterday and it's starting to bud out. It actually will have more flowers than leaves on it very soon. Um, it's very low maintenance. Um, I do not cut mine back. It's kind of topped out 
um, as tall as my obelisks um, will let it be, which is eight and a half, nine feet. And it's happy there. Um, it does need full sun. If you put this in really shady conditions, then it starts to stretch and get leggy. Um, it may have some disease like mildew crop problems. Um, but in full sun, it does great. It's very dense on a structure. Um, birds love to use it as nesting sites and for cover from predators. Um, and the maintenance on it is nothing um, unless you're trying to keep it in a container. Um, and then you may need to up pot it to a larger container over time or cut it back to control the growth, um, including root pruning, um, which is just when you take the plant out of the pot, you're going to replenish with fresh soil and you cut the roots back a little bit, just give them a trim, um, especially if you have any circling roots or anything like that. We have several um, species of native Carex. This one um, is one of my favorites because it thrives in full sun. Um, most Carex are really going to prefer to be in some shade. And this one is happy in either one. Um, it's really great for containers. Um, and it can be either that specimen plant or, um, you know, just kind of the backdrop and filler. Uh, it does have this fountain shape to it. So um, it can be a spiller as well, um, if that's what you need it to be. Um, they are evergreen. And um, so they have that all year interest. They provide great cover for um, small mammals and birds in the wintertime. Um, they do set seed heads um, and birds will eat them. They do not spread easily by seed um, and they spread slowly by rising. Unless this is growing in somewhat wet conditions, which is its ideal environment, um, full sun and wet. And it will take off and spread fairly rapidly um, under those growing conditions, but average moisture or drier, um, it tends to stay put. Um, so the maintenance on this is really low. You can cut it back once a year to kind of refresh any, um, you know, foliage that's not looking so great after the winter. Um, do it late winter, early spring before the new growth starts to push out. And that's all there is to it. Um, little blue stem is another native grass. Um, Carex is not a grass, it's a sedge. Um, the little blue stem is a native grass. Um, it comes in um, several cultivars that have different forms to them. So you have some that have this um, finer leaf blade, um, looks more like hair grass, and um, has a little less structured look to it. There are others, some shorter, some taller, um, that have wider leaf blades and are a little bit more upright. So, um, and some that even almost fountain. Um, they're the taller varieties. Um, once they reach a certain height, will start to bend and you get kind of a fountain effect. Uh, but for the most part, they're upright grasses. Um, they are pretty good spreaders, um, especially if you have open ground um, for them to spread to. But they have great fall color. Um, and they provide three seasons of interest. Um, other than um, making sure that you've got either a mulch bed or you're removing um, new plants as they appear, um, the maintenance on these are low. It would be the same as for the Carex. You're just looking to cut them back the one time a year.
Our other grass that we'll deal with is uh, the switchgrass, panicum. Um, this is quickly becoming my favorite native grass, um, particularly a cultivar called Shenandoah. Um, there are some older cultivars. Um, heavy metal is one and north wind that you may be more familiar with. The ones pictured here are north wind. Um, these are very upright, very dense, clumping grasses. This is a good choice if you're looking to replace something like um, a miscanthus. It doesn't have exactly the same form, um, but it does have the really lovely um, seed heads that blow in the wind um, and outstanding fall color. Um, Shenandoah turns like a bright red. They all have a coppery to red uh, tone in the fall as the temperatures start to drop. Um, maintenance on these is going to be sa the same for the other grasses. You're looking at uh, a, a cutback in early, um, early spring or late winter um, to remove any foliage that doesn't look great. Um, these are not truly evergreen. Um, because they have that great fall color, you may choose to leave them standing through the winter, but over time that red shade is going to fade uh, to more of a brown and you may not want um, to leave them as long, especially if you, um, if your garden style prefers something a little more tidy and manicured looking. Um, but you can leave them. They provide winter coverage for birds and other small mammals. Um, and a lot of insects use these dense grass clumps as overwintering sites. Um, and when I say insects, I mean both beneficial and not beneficial. Um, insects are gonna use those. I think um, lots of people are familiar with Black Eyed Seasons. Um, it's definitely not a showstopper in a talk about native plants. Um, the reason that I included it here is because it is fantastic for um, breaking up compacted soil. Um, and of all of the plants that I'm talking about tonight, it's probably the best for use in containers. Um, it's relatively short, even at the species. Um, there are some good cultivars. The main problem with this plant and the reason um, that some people don't like it is because it tends to be short-lived. Um, it readily reseeds itself. So you continue to have plants, but not the original plants that you put in the ground. Um, so this is kind of the opposite of some of the plants we talked about earlier, where you really don't want to cover the soil directly around this plant with a mulch. You want to allow it to reseed where it is, you know, in the area that you want it to stay so that you keep getting new plants to replace the ones that are dying. Um, but you would want to keep the mulch and exclude those seeds from any adjacent areas that you may not want these um, to move into. They're not fast spreaders, um, but they can't, you know, over time, they can start uh, to form these really large clumps um, that may be more than what you're looking for. Um, other than that, they're really low maintenance. Um, you give them, you know, whack back flower stems um, once a year, or you can leave them standing into the winter. Um, any of the cone type flowers um, that have that center ball seed head um, are particularly attractive of um, goldfinches. Really like those. Just got 
three or four more. Um, so I think we'll be good on time. Um, so this is Yarrow. Um, again, I included this one because um, it's not a brand new, exciting type of plant, um, but it is a really good plant um, for compacted soil in shade. Um, this plant will do well in the sun, but it tolerates quite a bit of shade um, and still blooms. And it will um, do well in high traffic areas that have been compacted or um, soil around trees um, that don't have a super thick canopy. Um, this does well. They are pretty fast spreaders. Um, I put them in the medium to fast because if you cut the seed heads back or the flowers back just before they turn to seed, um, you can control half of the way that they spread. They also spread by rhizomes, um, but that's an extra layer of maintenance. So it's really up to you and what your goals are. If you have very compacted soil um, that you need to do something about, this may be a good short-term choice, uh, but if you are not willing to do the maintenance to kind of keep it in check, you may want to look um, at some of the native grasses, um, which also have um, really deep penetrating roots that can help break up soil compaction. This is another really low maintenance plant, the pensamin or beard tongue. Um, it comes in a few different cultivars. Um, some are green, some the leaves um, are more of a reddish purple color. Um, Dark Towers is one of those. If you're really planting natives to support the most wildlife that you can, you want to avoid cultivars that have changed flower color, leaf color, the flower form or the flower shape because it makes them unrecognizable or de um, distasteful to the insects that would use these um, as a host plant. If that's not your goal, um, then the purple varieties are very striking in the garden um, as a backdrop to the, the white flowers. I have both in my yard um, because there's always room to compromise um, and it's fine to do both. Um, they're very low maintenance. They are slow to spread. Um, occasionally I'll get a rebloom in the summer if you know I happened to have an extra few minutes and I cut them back midsummer. I might get a late summer bloom out of them. Um, doesn't happen very often, but I'm not cutting them back very often. So some of you may have more success with that. Um, they do form nice clumps um, and are very upright. The plant um, at the ground level before it shoots up the flower stalks is more of um, a semi evergreen rosette. So um, the plant is gonna maintain some presence in the garden through the winter, um, but you will not see much of it. This is an ideal native plant um, if you really want things to look tidy um, or you want to put these into containers as kind of a filler plant. Um, they're very small. They're only about a half to one foot tall and one foot is going to include those flower spikes. Um, they make these cute little round mounds of pink flowers. Um, and there are, uh, the foliage is evergreen, so it's kind of in the, the garden holding its space all year, um, which is great. The flowers tend to be um, late spring or early summer, um, and this is a shade lover. Um, this plant will not tolerate a lot of sunlight, um, so you want to give it some shade. Um, it is a great um, seed source for birds. Um, and 
Um, it's a host plant for a couple of moths as well. Right, we've got two more. Um, so this is Phlox paniculata. Um, we saw this in an earlier picture that showed the shorter um, cultivars of the goldenrod. Um, this is a different cultivar of this. The flowers tend to be some kind of mix of white, pink, purple. Um, some a little darker, some a little lighter, some like this where it has that bright pink eye in the middle. Um, all of them range from about two to four feet um, and almost that wide. They do spread by rhizome fairly quickly um, after that third year of growth. Um, and they're spending those first few years just getting their roots in and established. Um, once they feel safe and secure where they are, um, they do start spreading. They're very easy to remove and they're gorgeous. So most people don't mind that they spread. They're able to you know, dig those out, put them in another place. Um, and kind of double the fun in the garden. Um, but they do um, sometimes require some staking to keep those heavy flower heads from flopping over. Um, you can control the height um, of these and keep them a little bit shorter by um, cutting them. And back um, in late spring, early summer, um, you're just going to kind of cut back a third of the plant. Uh, these are going to bloom um, in mid to late summer um, and even into the fall, some of the cultivars. Um, so it's perfectly fine for you to give them that Chelsea chop um, in the spring and help to control them. The stems get a little bit sturdier. They're going to hold those flowers up um, and maybe you don't have to do as much staking. Um, but that staking is really why I put them in a medium maintenance category um, because there's multiple times that you're going to have to go and deal with these plants throughout the year. Um, in the winter, it's just give them, I'm going to cut them back to a couple of inches above the ground. And last but not least, um, I almost didn't include this plant just for time, the sake of time. Um, but I found this picture of this plant growing in what must be the worst possible conditions. I mean, I guess it could be growing out of a sidewalk and it would be a little bit worse. Um, but this is just terribly compacted, high traffic areas. They've got these, um, you know, metal things in the ground. The soil does look a little bit better right around the plant. Um, and this is a plant that is listed as being um, basically the plant of choice for the toughest areas you can find. They do fantastic in medians, um, up close to pavement where it's very, very hot. Um, they're fairly drought resistant. They do not spread quickly at all. Um, you can collect seed from these and sow them and they will grow fairly readily from seed, um, but it kind of takes that collection step um, and removing them from the seed pod uh, to really get them to grow. Otherwise, it's as simple as just going and picking the seed pods off before <clears throat> they would break open on their own. Um, large flowers, um, some up to, um, about eight to 10 inches across, um, often called dinner plate sized flowers. Um, and they are kind of shrubby. Um, you do cut them back each year, um, but in the meantime, they have this more shrubby appearance, um, a little bit more structure than what you would think of from some of the um, more herbaceous perennials. They can be put in containers. Um, they need a medium sized container um, and then you would have to divide it every few years um, to keep the root ball um, the size that you would need for it to be in a container. Uh, but they adapt very well to that. 
um, particularly because of their drought tolerance. Um, they're not going to give out on you if you miss watering one day in July. They'll bounce back um, a little better than some of the others. Um, and I put them in the medium category for maintenance um, just because if you, um, you do have to pick those seed pods off to control their spread. You do have to cut them back once a year and you may have to stake the flowers. It's less common, um, but the real problem with these plants is they are loved, just absolutely beloved by Japanese beetles. And um, they will come and skeletonize the leaves. And so there are a few weeks in the summer where these plants look terrible. So you either have to do something about the Japanese beetles or you have to endure the several weeks that they look terrible as new foliage grows in. By the time the new foliage grows in, the Japanese beetles have largely moved on. Um, so it's not a repeat problem. Um, but it does make this plant um, a little less easy to use than some of the others. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm happy to take um, any questions. So we had a few comments, but um, one of the first questions was, do you need to know about utility lines for shrubs and flowers or just for trees? You would need to know if you had underground utility lines before planting out a garden. So if you have a cable line or a fan line, um, even water lines um, that come through your property underground, you would want to know where those were. Um, some properties have, you know, the power lines are coming underground from the street to the house, um, even if the, you know, you've got them above ground at the street level. Um, so you would want to check on those. Um, it's the law to um, call Miss Utility or um, do Virginia 811. I think it's 811.com um, is the website uh, where you can check, have them come out and mark where your, your utilities are. Um, but in general, you want to consider where those, you know, any limitations that you have on your planting space, you kind of want to know where they are um, so that you can plant around them. Okay, thank you. Did, can coral honeysuckle be used as a ground cover? Yes, it can. Um, and it's particularly good at controlling erosion on slopes. Um, but yes, you can just let it run through a garden. Um, it may add a little bit to its maintenance um, because it may encounter something in your garden that you that it wants to climb. And so you may need to go and you know train it off of those or cut it back before it, it climbs um, other shrubs or trees. It won't hurt other uh, um, shrubs or trees if it does climb them, but that may not be the look that you're going for. Okay. Does coral honeysuckle have medicinal purposes? And that was answered via Google <laughs> that Native Great, Americans use it, used it as a medicine or deal with Because that's not my area of expertise at all. <laughs> uh, let's see, when, when would you cut back the hibiscus? So I cut my hibiscus back. I do most of my cutting back of natives um, about now um, into, you know, the first of April, I'm midway through April. Um, the truth is that I do it when I have time and the weather is cooperating. cooperating. So the last couple of nice weekends we've had, I've been busy. The ones I've had free, it's rained, I'm sick of the rain. Um, so now is ideal um, and for maybe the next two to three weeks, but if you can't get to it in that time, um, 
you really want to do it before the new growth starts to push out. And for hibiscus, um, that can be as early as late April to early May or as late as June. And it just depends on how warm the ground is. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the Chelsea chop. Could you please explain this practice? Sure. Um, so the Chelsea chop is timed with the Chelsea flower show. So when you start seeing, um, you know, Facebook announcements or stuff in the news that Chelsea flower show is coming, that's the time of year to do it. Um, and you cut the plant back by about a third. Um, this causes the stems to kind of stiffen up a little bit, to grow a little more sturdier. Um, it refreshes the growth above. You end up with a more compact, sturdier plant. So when it starts to bloom um, mid to late summer or beyond, um, you're not going to have to stake as much. The plants tend to be a little bit fuller as well. Um, when they're more compact. Um, it is not recommended that you do this on things that are going to bloom in late spring or early summer um, because you're probably cutting off the flower buds at that time of year. Could you pull up the slide with the five top trees, please? Sure. And we have another question while that's coming up. Our yard is so wet in places. Do you have any suggestions oh, for, I guess it was for natives that prefer the wet? Natives that prefer the wet. Um, anything that has um, swamp in its common name. So um, there's your slide with the keystone species on it. Um, so swamp verbena, the uh, verbena hostata that I showed, there is a swamp sunflower called Helianthus angustifolius, which is fantastic um, for wet areas. Um, milkweed, the swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata is good there. Joe pie weeds do fantastic um, with a little bit of wet. Okay. Um, do we think that the Master Gardener Spring Plant Sale will have all of these plants for sale? I don't know. <laughs> and I have to admit, I don't either, but we... I would love to be able to tell you. Um, but I know that the people who are in charge of the Master Gardener Plant Sale will put out a list and they usually do some plant highlights. Um, and I noticed that some of the members of that team um, have tuned in with us this evening. So I'm sure that they are making notes um, to highlight the native plants that they are gonna be offering. And I will put in a, pl a plug for our fall garden festival, which is often attended by uh, some of the native plant societies. So there will there if you don't find them in the spring, there may be some others in the fall. Um, is it possible to obtain the transcript of the talk? The talk will be up on our website. Yeah, um, and I post them through YouTube, so that usually allows for captioning. Okay. Uh, somebody asked if the Chelsea Flower Show in the UK is in May or June. I can't remember. I can't remember either. I just I can Google. I that know it when I see it. I'm like, oh, I gotta go cut stuff back. Yeah, I can Google that while you answer. Um, can you pull up the first slide, please? Thank you. And it's going to be May 21st through May 25th of this year, the Chelsea Flower Show. I think that was my, well, this is my first first slide, but I'm assuming they want this one. I would think, yes. Um, somebody recommended button bush for the wet. Yes, button bush is fantastic, as is Clethera. 
Yes. And uh, we give away free seeds of many of these plants that I would think is at um, our library program. I live in South Central Virginia. Is there a good place to buy natives? I don't have South Central Virginia. I would recommend that you go to the Virginia Native Plant Society's website. They have um, a list of places that you can buy them. The plantvirginianatives.org website um, has links to all the native plant guides and many of those also have lists of retailers included um, as a resource. Um, I can't remember if they're in all of the guides or if they're just on the website, um, but those are two good places to look for um, things that are close to you. And I stand corrected, uh, the Master Gardener events at the Farmer's Market is where the free seeds are given away. So thank okay. you for that information. And that is all of it. Uh, there is a mention of the Hampton Hack that is done in June. So if you miss the Chelsea Chop in May, you can do the Hampton Hack in June. There you go. <laughs> Even I learned something tonight. Me too, well, I always do. Well, thank you so much, Stacy. I appreciate this. Oh, we have one more message. Oh, it was a thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we have, well, I'll let Karen talk about next month, I guess. Oh, okay. oh I can do it either way. Please. Thank you. All right. So um, next month, um, April 8th, um, we're going to be talking about some fantastic epic tomatoes that you um, can grow this summer um, with a tomato expert. Craig LaHoulier. There you go. This is, <laughs> yes. It's been a long day. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, the recording of this and a copy of the slides, will, um, I'm sorry, a copy of the resources that are listed in the slides will be up um, in the next couple of weeks on bbmg.org and we hope we'll see you next month and the website for the person who asked for the link is the one that you came on tonight it's vbmg for virginia beach master gardeners.org and the link to the uh, youtube 